start all over again and didn't have it turned on. I'd like to call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of June 18th, 2024. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Uh, Council Member Aguilar Hernandez. Council Member Escobedo. Council Member Cordero. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Soto. Here. And Mayor Patino. Here. I'd like At this time, I'd like to open the meeting to public comment period. Is there any public comment? There is not, Madam Mayor. Then I will close the public comment period. The City Council will now recess to a closed session and will reconvene to the regular meeting portion of the agenda at 5.30 p.m. Madam Clerk, can you please read the titles of the closed session items? Uh, yes, item 3A is a conference with the real property negotiators pursuant to government code section 54956.8. Uh, and item 3B is a conference with labor negotiators pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957.6. Okay, uh, this is adjourned. We will reconvene at 530. Mm. I would like to note that the interpreter for this evening is Mr. Bravo. Mr. Bravo, would you mind raising your hand in the back? Please ask him for a listening device if you would like interpretation services. 
Antes de llamar a la Junta de Orden, me gustaría notar que contamos con servicios de interpretación para esta Junta. El señor Bravo está sentado atrás. I'd like to call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of June 18th, 2024. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Council Member Aguilera Hernandez? Here. Council Member Escobedo? Here. Council Member Cordero? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Soto? Here. And Mayor Pacino? Here. The first order of business is uh, ask our Assistant City Attorney, Heather Witham, could you, would you please give us the report from closed session? Yes, Your Honor. Earlier this evening, the council met in closed session for two items. Item A was 3A, conference with real property negotiators pursuant to government code section 54956.8, and the council provided direction to its real property negotiator. The section, second item, 3B, conference with labor negotiator pursuant to government code section 54957.6, the council met and provided direction to its labor negotiator. There's nothing else to report out of closed session. Thank you. Next, we have a proclamation and council member Aguilera Hernandez will be making the presentation. Whereas racism and white supremacy have tainted the foundation of America, beginning with chattel slavery in 1619 and the denial of the humanity of those enslaved by the authors of the Declaration of Independence who declared all men are created equal, while holding men and women of African descent in slavery, and whereas African American black people continue to lack equitable and relevant evidence-based healthcare interventions and resources that would address the many health disparities contributing to having triple the maternal death rate of their white counterparts, regardless of their socioeconomic level. And whereas California high schools graduates black students at lower rates than all other racial ethnic groups and have failed to address the significantly lower percentages of black students who are offered and complete the college preparatory curriculum. And whereas workplace discrimination and racism continues to play a direct role in driving the persistent inequities that make Californians most likely to experience the devastation of unemployment, particularly among black workers, and whereas Juneteenth recognizes June 19, 1865 as the day enslaved Africans learned of their freedom in the southwestern states and allows for the celebration of the freeing of enslaved people, reflection on the condition of the lives of their descendants in the present day, and commitment to be anti-racist as the community works to end systemic racism. Now therefore, I, Alice M. Patino, Mayor of the City of Santa Maria hereby recognizes June 19, 2024 as Juneteenth in the City of Santa Maria and encourages all residents to use this time to learn about the legacy of black people, their contributions, and stand in alliance to end racism, bigotry, and hate. And we in this here hub, the mayor has set her hand and has caused the seal of the City of Santa Maria to be affixed here to this 18th day of June, 2024. And to accept this is Angie Bolden from Regional Advisor with the Black Student Union. I'm going to ask one of my students to come talk for me because allergies are in my throat right now. Milani and Gabrielle, Angela, this is my president from Brigetti High School, president from Pioneer High School, vice president from Pioneer High School. They're going to speak for me because my throat is bothering me. Well, th thank you for being here, Ms. Bolden. Thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you so much for um, acknowledging Juneteenth because it really encapsulates all that um, black people have been through and how much we have grown over the years, over centuries, and we just want to give a thank you for supporting um, our BSU too. 
Thank you for supporting our BSU and for supporting Africans, Americans, not only in this region, but also throughout the Central Coast. We appreciate it. Um, thank you for acknowledging our BSU and not only that, but other African Americans and also those who um, it took two years to, for them to hear that they were free and thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much and I appreciate it. Thank you and thank you girls for being here this evening. Really appreciate your being here. Next item on the agenda is a presentation on fireworks by our public information manager, Mark Vandekamp. Good evening, Mr. Vandekamp. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council, assembled guests and the audience. Uh, we want to just take a presentation here with a few props. It will not be simply a talk show. We have a couple of videos and some slides to share as well. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is briefly go through uh, what we're doing for our annual campaign for the 4th of July as it's drawing really close. We have a three-level approach which includes education, enforcement, and entertainment. And first, we want to wish everyone a very happy 4th of July and to remind everyone to be respectful of your neighbors and their pets. So we'll start off with the education component. Uh, we have a widespread bilingual fireworks education uh, campaign that's now underway. This is to inform everyone in the city what we're doing to help keep the peace, how to celebrate responsibly, how to avoid the $1,000 fine if you're caught using illegal fireworks, and to also empower residents to how to report illegal fireworks activity. Uh, so. First of all, we'll say that only safe and sane fireworks may be used within the city limits during a 12-hour period on the 4th of July from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. If you're watching and you're here in the room or on television, I encourage you to write down the following phone number, and then on your screen on the website, we have uh, some information for you as well. We have a fireworks hotline. Again, we use this every year. It's 925-0951, extension 3473, which spells out the word fire and that's being monitored by our great Santa Maria Police Department. And when you call that number, callers are given two options. You can elect whether you want to speak with someone live and report what you've seen by calling our police business line at 928-3781, or you can leave a message about what you've seen. And we want you to put down the address, the location, the name or names of persons involved, and a time and date of the violation so that when the police department monitors these calls, they can follow up. And then we have our first slide, which is up on the screen. Thank you. Uh, this is an online form for residents who can report illegal fireworks, and this is to request an administrative citation. And the address is cityofsanamaria.org forward slash illegal fireworks. And San Maria residents may request the issuance of an administrative citation for the possession, manufacture, storing, selling, handling, or usage of illegal fireworks through the third party site administration process. Uh, you must include some details, including the address, the person or persons allegedly responsible for the violation, the details. Uh, and I have to say, the incomplete forms are not going to be followed up on. We also need witnesses who are willing to testify, and only then can an administrative citation be issued. That's the law. So in terms of education, and we have this is where we have a few props and some videos. Every household is receiving the home coupon catalog, which has a, uh, on the inside page, an explanation of what the rules are. Uh, and we also have some free yard signs. We've done this since 2016. If anybody would like to come to City Hall Monday through Thursday, they can pick up a free yard sign. It's in English or in Spanish, and it has a wireframe. You can put this in the window of your apartment, or you can put it out in the yard. and. We have lots of these available. Uh, they've been pretty popular over the years. So just for a moment, I'll step away from the microphone. So we have them in Spanish. And we have them also in English. And you can 
just pop these into a frame. English and Spanish, you can use them year after year. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of veterans in our community and fireworks sound remarkably similar to the sounds of combat. Personally speak, spoken with some veterans who would rather not relive the sounds of combat by listening to illegal fireworks going off in their neighborhoods. Uh, we also have a number of people with autism or people with pets. And again, we're, we're coordinating with the County of Santa Barbara Animal Services to inform pet owners how to care for their animals. And County Animal Services is giving away free microchips for your pets during regular business hours every day. They have free collars, leashes, and ID tags. You can go to any shelter during regular business hours. And on their website, sbcanimalservices.org forward slash July 4, you can get some information. Um, getting close to wrapping up the education component, we have a very comprehensive messaging campaign, English and Spanish on social media. Four local radio stations, our government access TV on which you're watching this meeting, posters on our San Marino Regional Transit buses, city offices, the website, local news media. We've also mailed the flyers out to local veterinarians. As I mentioned, only safe and sane fireworks are permitted. We are permitting 26 local nonprofits and other agencies this year to sell safe and sane fireworks booths. Uh, and the sales will begin on Friday, June 28, and they'll be selling those through July 4th. And what are you going to get at those fireworks booths? Be besides your fireworks, you're going to be getting a you're going to be getting a flyer that will go in each and every bag that we provide the fire department with the rules, how you can avoid that fine, and when to use fireworks, English and Spanish. Uh, we've had 15,000 of those printed up. We will now move over to enforcement. Uh, the enforcement part of this has already also commenced. The police department is monitoring social media for fireworks sales and potentially will conduct search warrants for deterrence. Uh, public safety personnel are looking for and responding to uh, fireworks as uh, resources allow. Uh, last year, the police department issued 14 of these $1,000 citations. The city rangers also will be issuing fireworks citations. Last year, I believe they issued two or three. And then we also have a, uh, the fire department is coordinating a high altitude aircraft equipped with GPS and video to again fly over the city on the 4th of July, weather permitting to immediately and geographically pinpoint any launches of illegal fireworks. And this enables authorities to review the video. As they say, go to the tape and review which are clear cut cases and refer those for uh, prosecution. And last year, I believe we had 12 to 15, or let's say around 14 citations were issued in that manner. And uh, this year, we have a video, uh, a new video in English and in Spanish, uh, which is out on social media. And we've shared it with a couple of our local TV stations, and it stars our, our own fire chief. So if we could roll the video, please. Here it goes. This is Santa Maria Fire Chief Brad Dandridge with a message about illegal fireworks. The city will again use an aircraft with video and GPS to pinpoint launches of illegal fireworks. Property owners and or occupants of identified addresses will be fined $1,000. Instead, use only safe and sane fireworks from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. on the 4th of July. Let's all celebrate responsibly. Thank you. de Moveros de Santa Maria Brad Dandridge con un anuncio sobre fuegos artificiales ilegales. La ciudad volverá a utilizar una aeronave con video y GPS para identificar los cimientos de fuegos artificiales ilegales. Los propietarios y ocupantes de direcciones identificadas serán multados con mil dólares. En su lugar, solo utilice fuegos artificiales seguros y sanos de 11 a.m. a 11 p.m. el 4 de julio. Celebremos todos responsablemente. Gracias. Oh, thank you. So we'll next move over to the fun part of the presentation, which of course is the entertainment. Uh, and this year we're delighted to have our Recreation and Parks Department putting together what's called a Red, White, and Zoom 4th of July Tectacular Drone Show and Festival. And that will be held on Thursday, July 4th at the Elks Baseball Field behind the Abel Maldonado Community Youth Center right here on South McClellan Street. This is a 
going to be a really something to go to. It's a free family event. It starts at 2 p.m. and runs until about 9 p.m. There will be an outdoor concert beginning around 6 o'clock with a, the fan favorite 80s tribute band, the Molly Ringwald Project. We have, uh, we're allowing picnicking, but no barbecuing, tailgating, alcohol, or tents. Uh, there will be some food trucks selling some really delicious food. We'll have children's art and crafts, some lawn games, bounce houses, and free recreational swimming starting at 3 o'clock. And the Maldonado Center will be open with an open house from 8 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. for the entire family. Here comes the fun part. And we have a video of this, too. We have a yeah. custom patriotic drone show. We haven't done a drone show in Santa Maria before, and this is provided by DroneShow.com, and that will start at 9, and we have a video from DroneShow.com showing you what you may see, something similar to this. Thank you. So we're looking at a show that should last about 15 to 20 minutes. Again, this will be at Elks Field. Uh, if you know where the pool is or Elks Field, that's where it's going to be. So we encourage uh, you to uh, carpool. Uh, there'll be some limited parking available in front of the Youth Center along the Clown Street and, of course, in the uh, parking structure by the library and City Hall. Uh, we, the show should last about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, there should be about 200 drones. And of course, there'll be music, maybe a bit more patriotic music, we'll see. And then we also would like to, we, we need to make sure that we say thank you to the uh, sponsors that help make it possible. It's uh, People for Leisure and Youth, that's Play, the uh, San Diego Band of Chumash Indians, Driscoll Berries, and the Chamber of Commerce. As I said, uh, this will be the first time that Santa Maria's done this. So this is the three-legged stool that we're taking, or a three-level approach. We have education, enforcement, and entertainment to have a really nice 4th of July for the community. And if you have any questions about things, glad to answer those. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Escobedo had a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Actually, uh, first, I would like to congratulate uh, Chief uh, Far Chief. Excellent Espanol, uh, on point. Uh, thank you. Muchas gracias. That's, uh, <laughs> I'm not impressed because I've seen you speaking in, in Spanish before, but I'm uh, happy that you dare yourself to put yourself on the video. So, <laughs> and uh, the second, in it's that this in regards to the enforcement portion. Uh, last couple of uh, last week, I attended a meeting with the uh, uh, senior residents at Casa Grande, and that was kind of like the item. I mean, there were other items, but uh, particularly fireworks. Uh, personally, I think that's uh, it's pretty. You know, burning your money 
enough. Uh, and that, you know, that's, that, I don't think that should be the way of spending your money, but, you know. But on top of that, disrespecting and, you know, uh, our parents, senior residents, people that have pets, kids, it just obnoxious, and I, I don't, I don't like that. I think it's a, I, I get, I get the reason why every year we get for those phone calls, and you mentioned how to report. I think that's that's one of the keys, and so is people able to submit videos, photos, all that information through the website, and also over the phone. That's kind of like the reporting process. Yes, if you wish to use the, if you wish to report, we do need documentation and witnesses to step forward. Uh, documentation, as you've mentioned, can be a photograph or a video is even better. And you can bring that to uh, city attorney's office or to code enforcement or city hall and we'll accept that. It could be, say, like on a flash drive. Uh, if having the address, a precise location of the property where it was, and if, if possible, uh, showing faces of those responsible uh, so, it, so that we have something to look at which is actionable. And in regard with witnesses, uh, how, how often do we, uh, does that happen? The people, because I don't know if there might be some, uh, some fear to be the snitch, I would say, unfortunately. Is that, a, is that something that happens that people step out and say, yeah, uh, I witness this, I'll support what this other person is saying, or have you, or maybe, that might be a question also for the, uh, for, uh, maybe the fire department, the police department. Uh, what have you guys uh, experienced? Well, to date, we have not received a significant number of people who have been willing to be witnesses, uh, possibly for fear of retaliation or uh, bad feelings following the 4th of July. It could be their neighbor. It could be a, a well-placed fear. It just could be they don't want to have harm come to them. Uh, but again, it's uh, the law that we're simply, we are upholding. So if a peace officer does not personally witness this, then we need to have somebody, two witnesses actually, who are willing to, if necessary, testify in court with documentation. That's just the letter of the law. Uh, but to answer your question, it's rare. I, in fact, I'm not sure if we've had it occur that people have been willing to, uh, to step forward as witnesses. But Again, in order to do an administrative citation, that's the uh, letter of the law. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Could you just repeat again for the public, what time does the drone um, entertainment start and the, the hours? Oh, did you have a yes, question? Yes, the fireworks hotline number. Okay, the fireworks call in sure. hotline. The, the fireworks hotline is 9250951, which is the main city number followed by 3473, which spells out the word fire. Okay. And they can only do the safe and sane from 11 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night? Correct. Okay. On, only on the 4th of July. And only on the 4th of July. And then the, the show uh, uh, after dark, uh, it should be right around 9 p.m. on the 4th of July is when the drone show will commence. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Vandekamp. Appreciate it. Okay. Next, uh, next item on the on the um, agenda is the cons public comment period, and I have, and this is just to speak on items that are not agendized. Paul Tucker, followed by Jeremy Mace, followed by Matt Chirkop, followed by Gary Hall. Good evening, Mr. Tucker. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My name is Paul Tucker. I am president of the Santa Maria Valley Pioneer Association. I was invited here to, this evening to talk a little bit about the, a picnic. And it's not just any picnic. It's a picnic tradition that started in Santa Maria in 1924. And this year, we celebrate our 100th anniversary of the Santa Maria Valley Pioneer Picnic. So to give you a little history, the picnic started, was held east of town about 11 miles in an area which is now Twitchell Dam. 
And businesses in Santa Maria would actually close to allow their employees and people of the town to attend the picnic. And then for decades, the picnic was held at the Union Oil Picnic Grounds, where anywhere from 700 to 1,000 people would attend. In 1996, two members of the Pioneer Association, Clarence Donati and Al Novo, spearheaded a project along with dozens of other pioneers, a project to secure and build Pioneer Park. And now the city manages and takes wonderful, fabulous care of the park. So our 100th Pioneer Picnic is being held this year, July 13th, and I would encourage anyone to come out and attend the picnic. It's $15 for a Santa Maria style barbecue. It's a lot of fun, bring your families. You just need to bring your own plates, silverware and refreshments. And um, I know Alice has been there and it's a lot of fun and great way to see your fellow Santa Marians. Thank you. You know what's nice about it? You never know who you're going to run into. And you yes. probably don't recognize them because you haven't seen them in 10 years. But it's, exactly. just, it's really amazing. Yeah, you run into people. Every time you take another step, there's somebody else that maybe recognizes you and you recognize them. You end up running into lots of people lots you haven't people. seen in a long time. Yeah. It's great. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Tucker. Mr. Oh. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Excuse me. Mr. Thicke, I think you mentioned at the time when it starts. Starts at noon at the Pioneer Park on the 13th, which is a Saturday. And typically we have a little presentation, et cetera. And then at one o'clock we eat. And then um, you can hang out as long as you want, or you can eat and leave, whatever. You, you can dine and dash if you want, or you can uh, just hang out. It's really fun to hang out, it really is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jeremy Mace, followed by Matt Turkop. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, council members and city staff. My name is Jeremy Mace, first vice president of Local 2020 and fire captain within the city. And here we are, another council meeting and no mention of a Local 2020 negotiations. So my question is, which one of you will stand up? Which one of you will be the person to advocate for the citizens you are sworn to serve? Who among you will be the catalyst for change? the one to break the status quo and make things happen. It's time to quiet the rumors that you are flirting with an inability to govern and step up to be the leaders the community expects. Local 2020, actually the public, our citizens are suffering from your silence. Solid experienced firefighters who once felt valued and respected are now looking for employment elsewhere. Not a threat, a reality. Our neighbors to the north and south are hiring, and your employees are not just contemplating the idea, they're actively seeking employment elsewhere. You five govern this city, the five of you. Although staff provides recommendations for your approval, the way in which this city runs is determined by you. Your priorities dictate the level of service the citizens receive and the degree of value and respect the employees of this city feel. And unfortunately, your neglect has sent shockwaves throughout the city. It's clear the council prides itself in large all-cash projects and personal projects. But there is a cost. Just look at the number of interim directors in this room and the skeleton crews in all departments, especially within the fire department, and our inability to recruit and retain quality individuals. We, Local 2020, are 11 days away from being 17.5% underpaid. 17.5% underpaid. That's 17.5% less than the average salary our neighboring agencies receive. And think about that. Think about why work here? Why work in the busiest agency? In the fastest growing city, handling the most traumatic calls, why? 
Why do that and risk your life more often for such poor conditions? Because of your inaction, our members are asking themselves that every single day. The five of you have the ability and the power to change that. Your decisions can transform this city, retain our dedicated employees, and ensure that they feel valued and respected once again. So, which one of you will it be? Who among you will take the first step towards change? The community is watching, the employees are waiting, and the future of our city depends on your actions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mays. Matthew Cherkoff. Followed by Gary Hall. Good evening, City Council, City Staff, the Mayor, Community. My name is Matthew Cherkop, President of Santa Maria Firefighters Association. I'm here to t tonight to talk to you about negotiations. It's been almost six months of, since we've been on a contract. Your firefighters continue to serve the community day in and day out. Now with the fire season well underway, our members are also helping out our mutual aid partners all over the state. So that when, not if, Santa Maria needs help uh, and more help than we can provide, our partners will send help here. The budget message, and every budget message, attributes budget deficits to increases in staff, increases in pay and benefits and pensions. Why are the employees continually blamed for budget deficits? It's setting a tone here, it's one that doesn't sit well with us. Staff continues to put out fancy bar graphs in budget reports that show firefighters are the highest cost positions, yet they exclude the fact that as we work almost twice the amount of hours as a miscellaneous or police department employee, which is due to our understaffing and just our unique work hours. Understaffed, overworked, and we are criticized for posting large overtime numbers. Why is that? It's not our fault. For example, the May 18th budget presentation posted total salaries, minimum and maximum salaries that are wildly inaccurate. Those aren't base salaries. Those are when you factor in the understaffing and the overworked, uh, the extra shifts that we have to, to pick up to make up for, to maintain the community's safety and our daily minimums. Pensions. We heard a bunch of question and answers provided to the community, and the explanation of pensions was, was poorly explained. Think about it like this, and this is for the community. You pay a monthly premium for insurance, so that if you get into an accident or you get sick, insurance pays the claim. Think about that, equate that to pensions. Jeremy was up here a few moments ago. He mentioned we're 11 days away from being 17.5% behind in pay. That's 17% behind in pay compared to the average of the local market. We're not talking about number one. We're talking about the average. We're looking for change, and we're hoping that tonight you can make a proposal to include that change in the upcoming budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chercock. Gary Hall. Mr. Hall, I called your name, yeah. <clears throat> sorry, I don't hear as well as I used I'm to. I'm sorry, I should have called louder. My fault. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, staff, and citizens of Santa Maria. My name is Gary Hall. I'm a resident of Rancho Buena Vista, Mobile Estates at 2135 North Railroad Avenue here in Santa Maria. I represent the North Santa Barbara County Manufactured Homeowners Team, or Nesbitt. Let me once again remind you that over 100 other California jurisdictions have enacted effective rent stabilization ordinances and programs that have provided their mobile home park residents with the protection we seek. We continue to ask the city of Santa Maria to do the same. We hope that that would be the outcome when in 2018 and 2019, Nesbitt representatives work long and hard with the city and the mobile home park owners representatives to craft a program that would protect mobile home park residents from unnecessarily large 
annual increases, and other practices that threaten the elimination of affordable mobile home housing here in Santa Maria. Instead, we got the model lease with all its flaws and shortcomings. Our Nesbitt goal remains to provide protection to all Santa Maria mobile home residents presently living in an unregulated rental market where the current model lease program has been ineffective in protecting homeowner equity and maintaining affordable mobile home housing. We believe council members Soto, Escobedo, and Cordero recognize the ineffectiveness of the model lease and on June 6, 2022, they passed a motion that reads, and I'll quote, to examine the model lease agreement, looking for ways to improve it, and to look at alternatives. Thank you for passing that motion. Now, two years later, two years later, some progress has been made, but very little. We have found it very difficult to compete for time and consideration with ongoing labor negotiations, budget issues, downtown development, user fees, and now fireworks has reemerged. All are valid and important topics that affect a great many Santa Maria res citizens. We believe Santa Maria citizens living in mobile home parks also have a legitimate problem that could be resolved if the city and the city council had the political will to do so. Thanks to city uh, Assistant City Manager Wu, we now have a draft outreach plan, but so much work still remains before the June 6, 2022 motion has been satisfied. Some skeptics have said progress will only be realized only when the model lease is scrapped and replaced. We, the mobile home residents, are committed to continue good faith negotiations and efforts to meet the overarching Nesbitt goal I stated earlier. We are ready and willing to work with the city to achieve that goal with or without the participation of the park owners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. That closes the public comment period for this evening. Moving on to the consent calendar. Does anyone have an item that they wish to pull from the consent calendar? Nothing? Okay, I will pull item 12A as we have Lauren Bianchi Clemen from SPCAG here. To Madam, give a very short presentation. Madam Mayor, if I, if I can really yeah. quickly. I just wanted to also uh, just announce that we have received an additional document to be included uh, with item 12A3, which is the Spanish translation of attachment A. Copies okay. of the attachment have been provided there at the dais. We have some available here, um, and they will be posted online tomorrow. It's for this item. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, thank you, Mayor Patino and honorable council members. My name is Lauren Bianchi Clemen. I'm the Government Affairs and Public Information Manager for Santa Barbara County Association of Governments. It's a real privilege to be here tonight. I am really excited to tell you about what's happening with Black Road and Highway 166 tra traffic signalization and safety improvement project. Construction is going to start July first. Uh, this is to improve safety and traffic flow on a highly congested road. It's funded, as you know, by Measure A um, and something that the community has been asking for for years. I was out there today talking to residents and local businesses and um, on Bonita School Road as well, and they are really excited to hear that SB CAG will be getting to work. Uh, to improve that intersection. I want to thank the city of Santa Maria for being a partner in this effort. Um, and um, I'm here to share that there's more information about the project in your agenda packet. We are available for any questions that you may have now or in the future, information's on the fact sheets that were provided to the board clerk and left with you here at the city. Uh, also, uh, this project is just one of many projects that are happening in the 166 corridor um, funded by Measure A. In addition to that, Santa Barbara County Association of Governments will be launching a Highway 166 corridor safety study, so really appreciate the input of the City Council to help move that forward. And so we really look forward to the engagement of the public and the council on looking to how we can make future improvements in the corridor. Are there any questions? Mr. Escobedo? 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm very excited about it. And uh, 166 uh, for a lot of, our, particularly for my constituents on the Norway side, it's used daily to go to work back and forth from Guadalupe. And that's just the economic, is one of the economic drivers of the whole region and actually the, the, the county. And so I'm excited, I'm very excited. And just one question in regards to Main Street produce. Uh, it states here that there's um, some control, traffic control to come in and out. Uh, so that's already you guys been in communication with uh, with that company to make sure that uh, they, you know, they keep uh, keep on. Yeah, thank you for asking. We've had a couple of focused stakeholder group meetings as well as one-on-one -on -one meetings. Our project manager Fred Luna, director of project and delivery. Uh, was in contact with Main Street Produce also yesterday to give them an early preview of our, our press release that went out today. Um, so yep, they're a big partner in this and making sure that they're involved. Uh, really appreciate speaking with the city today uh, for the wastewater treatment plants right there too and will be impacted by there is a road closure at Black Road near the intersection that will happen for four weeks at the start of construction. Uh, so uh, that will be impacting employees at the wastewater treatment plant and everyone who uses Black Road um, for four weeks. That's a temporary closure. 166 will remain open during construction. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I would just like to make a comment. I don't, this goes back, and I was trying to remember, it's 15 <laughs> years, 20 years, but initially Caltrans wanted to do a roundabout there. And I don't think we got one public comment that said, yes, we would like a roundabout. So uh, <laughs> with the focus groups and the stakeholder groups, all really came out to oppose a roundabout. And they kept trying to push a roundabout. So anyway, we'll have <laughs> signalization going in there, and hopefully this will be a safer road. Yeah, we're really pleased to bring a project that the community wanted uh, to this area and funded. So that's a and really needed, special badly and needed. Um, unique <laughs> right. project. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Clemen, for being here tonight. So do I have a motion to I approve move. the consent calendar? I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Escobedo? Aye. Councilmember Aguilera Hernandez? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Soto? Aye. Mayor Patino? Aye. Next item on the agenda is the second hearing for the public hearing item on the user fee schedule for 2024. Interim Finance Director Xenia Bradford will make the presentation. Madam Mayor, can I quickly, yes. I just want to confirm that that motion in the second was for the entire consent calendar? Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. So we are here for the second hearing of the user fee schedule update for 2024. Uh, this slide here represents the current revenue fees in the first column and then the proposed uh, additional revenue that would be received by the city if the fees were to be updated at the current levels to be at 100% recovery. This is the same fees that you voted uh, affirmatively on at the first public hearing at the last council meeting. There is one change that has been made to the proposed uh, fee schedule to where staff is going to study further the, the utility fees for uh, the utilities department and bring those at a later date so those are no longer included in the update. So if you do once again choose to uh, approve the resolution, approving the new fees uh, at 100% recovery, it would add about $1.1 million to the general fund a year. And the action that we are asking you to take today is once again adopt the resolution, uh, hold this public hearing, open for public hearing, and then consider adopting the resolution which would then uh, be the final approval of the schedules and the new fees would go into effect on July 1st. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council? 
Hearing none, I would like to open up, um, up, open this up for a public hearing. Are there any requests to speak or any written requests? There are not, comments? Madam Mayor. Okay, so I'll close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? I move. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Council Member Escobedo? Aye. Council Member Aguilera Hernandez? Aye. Uh, Council Member Cordero? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Soto? And Mayor Patino? Aye. Moving on to 13B, the next on the agenda is the budget for 24 26. Interim Finance Director Ms. Bradford will also be making this presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, uh, Ms. Bradford is getting set up just uh, by way of introduction uh, and comment. I just wanted to take a minute to uh, thank all the staff that was involved in preparing the budget. I think I mentioned it at your uh, special budget meeting that. It's a pretty complex document. Uh, all of you received it, you know, over 300 pages of facts and figures uh, to be considered uh, by you this evening. One of the things that I think is uh, key here is that the, this budget presentation is physically different than, than our past budgets have looked. It's, it's somewhat similar, but it was a new format that was uh, used by our finance department, and I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Bradford and uh, the team at finance for their work on putting this document together, and also the team at city manager's office who helped coordinate uh, much of the, of the text that's in the, in the document. Uh, I think I mentioned to each of you that this is a real difficult budget to bring forward to you. It is, uh, one where uh, the projections don't look uh, great for us, and where we're actually gonna be looking at uh, having to, to tap our reserves in order to, to meet the balanced budget requirement. Uh, I'm gonna have Ms. Bradford go ahead and walk us through the presentation, and if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask us. Thank you, Mr. Posada, Mayor and the Council. Today's presentation will focus on, uh, once again, receiving the presentation of the final proposed budget for the two fiscal years from 2024 to 26. You would hear the public testimony at uh, this public hearing on the proposed budget. And then the final action that we would be asking the Council to take is to adopt a resolution, adopting the budget for the fiscal years 24-26 adopting policy actions, and delegating the city manager to implement the same. So to remind the public of the budget process and the multiple steps that uh, led us to today, want to once again walk through the steps that the council and staff have taken to preparing these recommendations. On February 19, the City Council held a goal-setting session, which was a public hearing uh, where public was welcome to attend and make any comments uh, before the Council uh, selected their uh, adopted goals for the next two uh, years. On May 21st, we had a fairly lengthy presentation of the preliminary budget where the Council was introduced to all of the financial trends. Um, we looked at the fund balances, the total expenditures and revenues that would be included in this proposed budget. And the council also had an opportunity to hear from each department about the proposed programs that uh, represent those dollars that are being asked to be allocated. On June 3rd, the city council held a special session on the budget where staff answered specific questions from council members on the information presented on May 21st. And then today, here on June 18th, we are here for the final budget hearing that would adopt the budget uh, as the legal spending plan for the year of 24-25. So these are the four broad goals that the City Council had adopted for, based on their uh, February 19th deliberations, long-term fiscal sustainability, community quality of life, planning and infrastructure, and organization well-being. You also approved the following priorities for the next fiscal year, which were new approach to economic development, to provide youth opportunities, provide public safety resources, and establish a staffing plan. So these were the goals that staff took uh, in preparation of the budget that's in front of you today. 
So citywide proposed budget represents the dollars that you see in great detail in the budget book document that was distributed with this council agenda, but it really represents the spending plan that supports all of the operations and the services that the city provides today. So this org chart represents all of the departments and the work that uh, are, is included in this financial plan. This chart here indicates all of the goals that the departments will be working towards um, based on the goals that you voted and the dollar amounts are all uh, in alignment with those goals. This slide represents the total budget that you would be adopting today should you approve the resolution. So for 24-25, the total budget for the city, citywide, is uh, almost $364 million. And for 25-26, it's almost 347. And we'll be coming back to you next June for the actual adoption of the 25-26 budget. As we mentioned during the preliminary hearing and the special hearing on June 3rd, is that the city unfortunately is experiencing um, a systematic problem with the budget deficit within the general fund, including Measure U, where our revenues, which are shown in the green, are not meeting their expenditures, which are shown in the red on this chart on the left side. On the right side, you would see what that means for the city's reserves in order for the city to pass a legally budgeted or balanced budget. So the proposed budget does propose drawing $21.3 million from reserves in order to balance the budget for 24-25. This chart here provides with the details of how the reserves would be drawn in order to balance this first year budget. So we would be looking at using $8.5 million in reserves from the general fund that were unassigned, 4.4 from Measure U, and $8.3 million from the local economic augmentation fund. That would mean that there would be no undesignated funds left in the general fund, the measure U, and then the LEAF will have $2.2 million remaining. This slide here just shows by department uh, how the expenditures have grown from 2018-2019 to the current proposed budget. So we went from 80 million in total allocations for general fund and measure U to proposed 139.8 million. This chart here shows uh, a brief outlook of how positions have grown over the years. So the proposed budget for 24-25 uh, incorporates 680 full-time positions and there is no change uh, proposed for 25-26. Uh, this item here is based on prior council direction from the mid-year budget hearing, which adopted the budget for 23-24 current fiscal year, and it simply represents the direction that the council gave at the time for staff to bring back um, a discussion for city council regarding the city council compensation. So proposed policy recommendations with this budget are as follows. Staff uh, recommends that we determine sustainable ongoing expenditure level for the general fund and measure you and engage departments to propose recommendation, recommended modifications to the services and programs to restructure and close the budget gap by the end of 24-25. So this recommendation would mean that there would not be a necessity for further draw on reserves uh, in the second year of this biennial budget. We also propose that the City Council initiate revenue measure feasibility analysis and staff recommends approval of an additional $100,000, uh, which is not currently included in the proposed budget, but this would be an initiative that the City Council may elect uh, to move forward with in order to study uh, potential feasibility for new revenue sources, which could include tax measures. Uh, the third recommendation is to study the current economic development program to ensure that economic development efforts are closely aligned with the city council policies and goals. This will be an ongoing um, project for the staff to engage uh, as this new fiscal year begins. 
The fourth recommendation is to initiate regular evaluations and updates to citywide fees to ensure full cost recovery. So your policies in the proposed budget book do indicate that, that the council would be committed to 100% cost recovery. To study alternative funding sources to fund the city's future growth, i.e. improve the current landscape district and community facility districts to meet the needs as the city continues to grow. And then the final recommendation is to fund a citywide salaries and benefits study in the amount of $125,000, which would directly correlate with the council uh, goal for the staffing plan. The proposed policy recommendations included in the document that you would be adopted today should you elect to do so is one, to set a target level of reserve in the local economic augmentation fund at 5%. Currently, there is not a particular goal set uh, as policy by the council of the general fund and measure U annual ongoing, which means excluding capital expenditure program operating appropriations for that year. The draw from fund balance beyond the 5% threshold would require council approval in alignment with council set policy for the use of LEAF. So just a reminder that the LEAF, those monies are set aside for when the economy takes a downturn and so the city would be able to use those monies in order to not impact our ongoing services to the community. The second recommendation is to add cost recovery policy, identifying principles for 100% user fee recovery unless other approved otherwise based on council policy determination for the public benefit. So those policies and the language have been updated in the document clearly indicating that council direction. The third recommendation is to update the general fund prudent reserve that will occur annually based on 25% of operating appropriations. Should the prudent reserve commitment be used and its level falls below the minimum amount, the goal is to replenish the fund within two fiscal years. So the city council already has a policy of 25% reserve, however, it has been set it will within the funding level uh, when it was originally adopted. So it was uh, in 2010. So if we would be to set it at today's uh, levels of expenditures, that amount would be higher. The fourth recommendation is to set reserves for internal insurance funds to appropriately fund rising insurance premiums, fund at levels established by actual anal actuarial analysis for claims and liabilities, and set aside self-insurance reserves for uninsurable assets. And then the last uh, recommendation is to memor memorialize the purpose of the LEAF as a reserve fund established in 2000-2001 to be used as the primary financing mechanism to address any potential revenue shortfalls during times of economic downturns or severe state action so as not to significantly impact the operating budget and service levels of the general fund. That brings me to the conclusion of the presentation, available for any questions and the action that we would be looking for from the council, if you would like to adopt the budget which needs to be adopted before July 1st is to adopt the resolution adopting the budget for fiscal years 24-26, adopting policy actions and delegating the city manager to implement the same. Are there any questions? Can you give me an example of an insurable asset? Uninsurable? Uninsurable asset. Um, well, one of the simple examples is, uh, for example, in our fleet, the deductible that the city is required to pay now is so high that in certain instances it would be cheaper for the city to self-insure and pay for a vehicle that's damaged versus paying the deductible. Okay. There are also some of those instances in our properties. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Questions? I, Go ahead, I, I have Ms. a Soder. question, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. One of the questions that I have is um, pertaining some of the positions that, was, that were listed in, in the budget. Um, I just, I believe it was like the tech, confidential tech positions um, that were added to the city manager's department and if I'm not mistaken, finance and HR. Um, and just confirming that 
those are not ARPA positions or previously ARPA positions. Thank you, Council Member Soto, Mayor and City Council. So the ARPA positions, um, I think I mentioned at the last meeting, will end on June 30. Mm -hmm. There are currently, as I understand it, and I'll defer to, uh, to um, uh, Ms. Jackson just to make sure, but I believe that there are two positions that remain ARPA at this time. The other ARPA positions have been have competed for other city jobs that were open and have moved from the ARPA funding into uh, a general fund position that was in the budget. Uh, some of those people were moved into the ERP uh, positions that were funded, again, limited term positions. Uh, so at this point, on June 30, the last two ARPA positions uh, are eliminated from uh, the budget. Thank you. Thank you. My other question is, um, thank you. It's it, it's regarding the the user fee schedule. Is that revenue already projected into this budget? Yes, Councilmember Soto. That revenue was already included in all of the schedules of the budget. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Sorry, I keep, they keep coming after I turn off the mic. Uh, my other question is um, when we, when we looked at the draft budget, I believe we were looking at about a 17 point some million dollar deficit. And now I'm reading this budget, it's looking more like 21. And, so, and the, the, around the same amount for the following year. Can you explain the variance there between this budget and the, and the drafted budget that we saw at the May meeting? Uh, thank you for that clarification, Council Member Soto. There, so the documentation that was presented to you with a preliminary budget in May compared to the document that's in front of you today, there's a couple of changes that were made. One, when you look at how the um, budget gap was presented in, at the preliminary hearing. Is we, we were showing the budget gap split between general fund and measure U. Whereas measure U, we shouldn't be communicating with other funds. So instead of uh, showing that budget gap in measure U, we transitioned all of the shortage to general fund itself. And so the tra transfers of leave and whatnot would be deposited directly into the general fund. One other change that was made uh, was that the preliminary budget did not have uh, included in it funding for the uh, dispatch center, the new dispatch center, and that was a true up that needed to happen because the city is already on that path and under that contract. So we made sure that that's included in the funding. So it went from 20.8 total budget deficit to the 21.3. Yes. <laughs> Um, can you explain that first part again of, of general fund measure you? I, I believe you were saying that they were in the preliminary budget. I, did, I do remember seeing them as separate. And in this budget, we see them combined, right? Where we, you talk about general fund and measure you funds. Is, is that what you, you were just saying now? Correct. So technically, Measure U is uh, a subset of the general fund. However, right. we do keep track of that accounting very clearly so that the oversight committee and the public knows how the Measure U funds are being spent. And we simply uh, have expended in the proposed budget all of the available revenues for Measure U within that Measure U fund. And then all of the budget gap is shown within the general fund. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, no questions here. I will um, open this up for a public hearing. And I have several requests to speak. Uh, Matt Chirkoff, followed by James Malena, followed by Stacy Newby, followed by Sandra Dickerson. Good evening. This is Matt Jerkop, Santa Maria Firefighters. 
thank you for the opportunity to comment on the proposed budget. Uh, I want to highlight a few things. The very beginning of the budget, council has four priorities listed. One of those priorities are provide public safety resources. Yet, as you just heard, your firefighters are falling behind in pay compared to the average market, 17.5% on July 1st. Also, the fire department funding uh, has been reduced by several million dollars in this budget. Also, uh, what was just up there was a proposal for the prudent reserve, um, the recommendation uh, for the reserve to be set at 25% of the general fund. To my knowledge, since inception around 2001, the prudent reserve has not been used and has remained at $19.8 million. The question I have here is where has all that interest been going and why are we choosing to increase the balance of the prudent reserve when we've never needed it? The resolution for this item lists 10 resolves. Number seven says, the city manager is authorized to continue to underfill classifications. Also, um, which has been a habitual issue here in the city, we, we continue to budget for positions and we leave them vacant for many years. Uh, we've had some fire prevention officers in the fire department that have been vacant for four plus years now. Also, there's a proposal or there's the language here to continue the performance based pay program for management employees. Just thought I'd ask you, is that a good idea considering we're $20 million in the hole this year? Number nine, which I believe is the most important, this allows all general fund operating surplus as of June 30th of each year to be deposited equally between three funds and identified as one-time only, uh, uh, one only monies for general fund expenditures. This is really important to note as we've been highlighting this item for years. The fiscal year ending 2023, we had an excess of $8.4 million of general fund revenues. The year before that, we had $23.6 million excess in general fund revenues. And the year before that, we had $4.9 million in excess general fund revenues. A couple more questions for you. The budget says 14 new full-time equivalents in year one and only 4.8 full-time equivalents um, are paid for with the general fund. That graph that we just saw said between this current budget and the proposed budget, the full-time equivalents went from 625 to 680 full-time equivalent positions. I think we need to know uh, what that's all about. Also, why are we funding $125,000 for a compensation study when every MOU in the city has a salary survey identified in there? We're just wasting money. You can have somebody at City Hall do their job and do the math. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chirkop. James Milena. Good evening, Madam, Mr. Milena. Good evening, Madam Mayors, Councilmen, staff. Right. Um, 2019, we came in here to save our fields. It's been five years now. We got a different curveball thrown at us at Seamus Park, um, ADA approved. So they shut down Seamus and we needed to uh, get ADA approved there. So we need to get in the budget so we could uh, get that field back to normal. They shut us down here last year. They moved Southside out. And so that field is shut down because of uh, ADA. So now we're asking that the city council in their budget look at getting the funds necessary needed to make Seamus Park usable again. And that consists of the two fields in the basin and the Alks fields on top. Uh, there is a lot of maintenance to be done at both fields. We need to Fix the fields that we have already. Those are three baseball fields up there. We have actually con field too that we like to uh, fix in the future. Currently, Brent Smith and I have approached the Santa Maria Alps Lodge and they're, they're here tonight. They uh, agreed to support us in our endeavors to um, preserve Alps Field and Seamus Park. They're under the condition that this, they know that the city is behind the support and the city has a plan. Uh, recently, I resigned my post as commissioner of Parks and Rec so I can proceed with um, Seamus Park. 
and we call it Siemens Park because there's three bait fields there, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the Siemens Park. So save our fields, we're back. Last time we came here in 2019, we had 200 kids marching on City Hall and doing all that stuff. I don't think we have to do that this time. Um, I think the Brent has been there and he's seen what we needed to do. Alex has been working on the plan. He said Angela has been working on a plan. So I think that we just need the money and the funds to proceed further. We have support from our community. I am the new general manager of the Santa Maria Indians nonprofit. So we have brought those guys back. The Santa Maria Indians are here and the baseball club is here now to support this endeavor. So whether uh, the funds are provided by the city, we feel that we can raise the money and we want to raise the money to make Southside uh, ADA approved. So I keep on looking at the clock because I'm kind of stressing on it, but uh, <laughs> I think that uh, we can, as a community, solve this problem. And you'll hear more from Southside and you'll hear more from uh, Stacy Newby, which her grandson was, you know, part of the handicaps. Thank you. I have Thank a you. question. Thank you. Yes, do, Ms. Aguilera Hernandez. Do we have the amount of how much it would cost to make it ADA? No? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member uh, Aguilera Hernandez. We do not, the study has not been completed. Uh, there's been some design work done, Public Works has worked on it, and we also have uh, our, uh, our landscape architect contractor working on it. But an actual number hasn't been finalized yet. But the work you're doing is out. There, there have been a number. Sorry. Come, come to here. Can you come to the issue? Do you have a slip? I do. My name is Chavez. Um, just to speak on the behalf of the amount, uh, there has been an amount as I sat uh, with some people um, yes, at the end of last season. The amount that they brought out to us just to make it ADA approved is a minimum of $500,000. Okay. Is and that, that's just for the ramp itself. It, is that... Handicap access. Is that through... It, is that the consultants that the city is working with? Council Member uh, Soto, so the number for the ramp is one number. The issue that it creates at Seamus Park is once you provide a path of travel down to the field, it opens up the need for addressing handicap accessible parking, handicap accessible seating. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, is, it is one of those things that kind of snowballs. And in order to get the entire picture, that's where we need to have a complete design. Mm -hmm. We may choose, uh, and again, I'm gonna maybe look at the city attorney. Um, we, may, we may come up with a big plan as to how to get everything done. Uh, we may be able to use that plan as kind of our defense basis should we get any claims for access as we move forward with a, with a scheduled plan of improvements. But at this point in time, we're not at that point yet. But we're working towards it. Yes. And the studies that you've already done, those are already included in the budget? No. There's no money in the budget right now uh, for any improvements there. Typically those items we would look for either grant funding from or we would look to uh, using other funding uh, for those kinds of projects. Uh, Mr. Malena has mentioned to me on several occasions that the community is willing to step up and we certainly want to take advantage of those kinds of opportunities. Uh, there's also some, uh, uh, some nuances you know, in contracting law and how we can involve volunteers and to what level. All those items would need to be addressed before we can move forward with a with a plan. Is this part of was the, was this park part of the 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 park assessment? The, the restrictions? No, the seamless was included. Uh, I can go ahead, come on up to the podium. Uh, we'll have uh, interim director uh, Oslin address that. Councillor Soto, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, so yes, it was included, but it was included just in terms of ordinary operations and maintenance. The parks assessment didn't include any conversation about what it would take to upgrade any of our facilities or any of our fields to ADA compliance. So currently I'm working with Mr. Fulgoni on addressing 
um, a priority list of what we would want to take a look at and see Ms. Field is the, one of the priorities on that list. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Ms. Aguilar Hernandez. So where, yeah. the money that we're gonna expend on the reports, where is that? Currently we've been um, absorbing that with our, our budget. So, that, so what we've done is taken a preliminary study to evaluate what it would take to do a project. Um, we have some, some numbers that are very ballpark again, as Mr. Posada said. It's something just to get us going to be thinking about what it would take just for the field, but we haven't talked about the ADA path of travel or any of the other improvements that would be need to, need to be made, <clears throat> including any restroom upgrades. So once you start to do an accessibility project, it opens a can of worms that then cascade to other things like um, bleachers, bleacher access, field access, ramp access. So it's, it's, it's a start, it's what we have to get going, um, and then we'll continue on as we do a, a ADA accessibility study. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to have uh, Mr. Fulgoni come up and public. This, sure. this, sure. this would be a public works project. Sure. Good evening, council members. Um, there is a line item in the budget for an ADA transition plan for CAST studies to be performed at various city facilities. We will be undertaking that project. We're looking at change order in this particular field into that to see if we can have a CAF specialist look at this field. Um, so there is some potential for us to get some more answers to this question uh, through that process. So that is something that's already underway and, and in the works. So, okay. But it is I, a, a sp no. very, very specialized type of study that we will be doing. Because I, I did see that line item, but nowhere did it say it was designated for Seamus Park or anything. I wasn't able to tell that that was the, tied to that. Expense. Yeah, there's city. It's, okay. it's to look at city facilities and the transition plan for those facilities. So and, it is in the budget. Okay. Yeah, because parks are are a completely different animal than looking at a building or looking at sidewalks or looking at at ramps and those types of things. So we have to look at each piece a little bit differently. But perhaps there's an opportunity with this one because of the nature of it to. Make it easy. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. You know, just to comment on that, um, and Mr. Flagoni, as I know that with the Elks Rodeo Ground, the Elks and its members have volunteered and have done all kinds of work out there. So I'm sure, and that's what they've done in Santa Maria, whether it was Butch Seamus and Clarence and other people, they came in and really got and did the work. And so, and, and I realize some of that is specific to the engineers that we have to have and everything, but you know, I'm sure that's why they're here tonight because they're willing to come forward. And, and, and they put a lot of money into our community and our youth also, but to also do the work on that. Thank you. Any other questions on that? No. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Escobedo. So, after re reviewing this, uh, this budget, so as I understand, oh, it might be for a senior, no, not for the parks item. So how I read the numbers, this means that we might end up with our reserves by the end of 24, 25. Is that accurate? So the, if the council adopts the budget the way it is today, you would authorize in order to balance the budget from a legal perspective, make it adoptable up to $21.3 million in reserves. And those reserves would come from undesignated general fund, from Measure U, and then from LEAF. And w those will be depleted? The, by, okay. And, um, Okay, and I, also, excuse yeah. me, but I have to go on with the public oh, comment. Oh, right, yeah. right. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> Stacy. <laughs> well, I jumped into Were that. you Stacy, newbie? Oh, Stacy, newbie. Okay. 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 You're next. I'm so ready with the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Hi, everybody. I'm not a speaker, but um, I'm going to shoot from my hip here. Um, we went out with Alice, and I think it was Gloria, five years ago, looked at Seamus Park, tried to save it from soccer, 
Brett Smith, Jimmy Malena, and myself. We went around and looked at all the fields. Um, I was involved in Babe Ruth for over 40 years, including my husband, my son. I've worked for the high school district for starting my 44th year. I know a lot of people, and if we have to go get these people riled up, I will do that. I'm also president of our union for the classified employees of the school district. I went to Alex six to eight months ago with my grandson who was in a wheelchair and gave him a letter and never heard anything back. Um, he's been in a wheelchair half his life, 15 years. He played Southside Little League until he couldn't play anymore and he was in a wheelchair after, you know, at, when he turned 15. He tried to coach last year. There was no ramp, there was nothing for him to get down there. I have a bum knee. I saw an older gentleman fall on the on North Miller side on the steps. The steps are about like that. Same on the other side. There's no way for a wheelchair to get down there. So they had him drive their van, his wife, he doesn't drive, drive his van down onto the field with all the kids out there to let him out and then back up the hill again. We had an injury during Babe Ruth over at uh, Conn Field where a city worker accidentally ran over a guy sitting on the lawn. And I kept thinking that the whole time. Somebody's going to get hit. Somebody's going to get hit. This year they moved out to South, um, not Southside, Robin Ventura Field, which is great. But if you've gone out there on a Saturday when Southside's playing, it's a speedway through that on um, Sunrise Drive. They come around the curve, they don't see you, there's kids crossing, carrying equipment, all kinds of stuff. It's a nightmare over there. The fields are nice, Southside does a good job of taking care of them. They've already been robbed of their, um, their trailer out there. There's no, there's no lights or you know anything out that way. Um, my parents were born here, my grandparents, we've all gone through Santa Maria High School. My kids, my grandkids, and it's, it's not right. My, they're all, all my family are contractors, Reinstead, and my dad did a lot of work at Southside growing up. My husband, who passed last year, played Little League at Southside with Smitty, and he lived right across the street, so that was his playground. They all went there to play. And there's nothing anymore, and there's no handicapped bathrooms either. I am handicapped, I have my placard, there's nowhere to go to the restroom around there or go down the field. That's it. Thank Sorry. you, Stacy. <laughs> Thank, Thank, Thank you. Sandra Dickerson, followed by Peggy Briarton, followed by Anthony Lang. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, I represent the Executive Committee and our Board of the Santa Maria Valley Chamber of Commerce. I want to speak to the budget item for the City's funding for economic development activity. As you know, the City has retained the services of the Chamber to provide economic development work for over 20 years. We are confident that the Chamber has done an excellent job in this area over those years. We want to thank staff for meeting with the Chamber last week and appreciate efforts to work with the Chamber on extending the economic development contract for a year, allowing us to retain the very high level of talent that we have um, while you evaluate this area. We're supportive of the City's plan to hire a consulting firm to evaluate how economic development is currently done in the community and potentially identify changes or opportunities for improvement. And we hope to be a part of that process. Our recent development of a monthly report for the city with the first one issued last week will be instrumental in that review and I know that highlights a significant scope of work being accomplished for our city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dickerson. Peggy Briarton, followed by Anthony Lang. Good evening, Ms. Briarton. Good evening, Mayor and Council and staff. Um, Wow, I was hoping that I could hear a little bit of discussion possibly on TOT or something that has been ha has happened in, in discussions that maybe I missed out on. Um, I don't know if that would help much, uh, adding more TOT to uh, raise that up a little bit. Um, but um, you, you can certainly bring it up. I can? Yes, you oh, can. Okay. <laughs> so so my, my 
concern was that um, obviously the fire, firemen need mo more money. They need to get at least average amount of money. After hearing again tonight, I mean, it's just, I'm surprised that we have any retention, <laughs> that they're not just fleeing. Um, and it almost sounds like that that's at the point we are. So we're very unsafe with that. Um, now the TOT, as my understanding is it's 10%, or it's 12% if you're counting the chambers 2%, whether that's part of the 10 or it's 12. It's actually 10 and then the tourism is the 2%, right? So it is a total of 12, 12. if you put it together. Thank you. So um, the TOT in itself, um, the county is going to uh, try to get 14%. Mm -hmm. I know Buellton's also going for 14%. Um, ours being split like it is, it almost sounds like it's actually already 12, but it's just split up differently. Um, is there any opportunity to get that onto the ballot to talk about that increase? I know that that was going to be a spit in the bucket when it comes to helping with the fire department, but it's something, some effort, um, something needs to be done. And um, I'm hoping that I hear some other creative ideas. That's not as creative as I'm sure you guys can be, but uh, something needs to be done because we're losing our firemen and uh, we're all unsafe. So thank you. Thank you. Anthony Lang, followed by Myra Chavez, followed by Jeremy Mays. Good evening, Mary. Mayor Patino and council members. Uh, I appreciate you guys' commitment to our city and I appreciate the city's commitment to youth baseball um, and to the Parks and Rec for uh, making accommodations at uh, Robin Ventura Field for us this year as I'm a coach at Southside Little League um, and Little League I think is one of the I think it's the biggest and probably one of the best youth sports organizations in the world. And it's less about baseball and more about building children of great character and responsibility and just building good citizens. Little League also has a challenger division, which brings handicapped and special needs kids out onto the ball field. and. I work as a behavioral support aide for special needs kids right now, and uh, I, I think they're kind of marginalized uh, in a lot of programs. And we have an amazing city and um, a parks and rec department. We, there's all kinds of programs that oftentimes go unused. People don't utilize them all. And the Little League field isn't used to its full potential, but I believe if that improvements were made there that and it's a nicer facility it would be it would serve more children and um, taking care of kids is a big part of what makes a community and a city great so I don't envy you and your guys's responsibility with budgets and finding funds and all that um, but I, I hope that there is funding in there to make accommodations for Southside Little League and the Seamus Field to make it handicap accessible and to address the needs of uh, the children. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Kids are important. <laughs> Myra Chavez, followed by Jeremy Mays, followed by Charlie Martinez. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and staff. My name is Myra Chavez. I serve as the president of Santa Maria Southside Little League. As a long-standing member of the community, I have witnessed firsthand the gradual decline, the parks and infrastructure. Seamus Park is the home of the oldest little league uh, here in Santa Maria, and it holds a special play, place in my heart and a lot of community members' hearts. However, the current state of despair of dis is disheartening and has significantly impacted the, its usability and safety. To be temporary, temporarily relocated this past season has been the utmost difficult, challenging um, season thus far. I've been president for the last three years, been part of uh, Southside for the last 11 years. 
Um, there were an abundance of obstacles, not only the organization, but Parks and Recs um, also had to fulfill. Improving our home will encourage an improvement relationships with Parks and Recs, as it's one we value greatly. It is time to prioritize this long overdue project by allocating sufficient funding for its revitalization. By investing in Seamus Park, we enhance community quality of life, demonstrate our commu commitment to pres uh, preserving our local heritage and promoting outdoor recreation opportunities. We are a nonprofit organization and we do strive to leave no children behind. Um, we have a lot of day-to-day -day activities and um, responsibilities that we like to in instill in these kids. I urge you to consider the profound impact of revitalization Seamless Park for our community well-being and collective pride. This project is not just about improving infrastructure, it is about investing in the future of our community, creating a legacy that f future generations can cherish. Thank you for your attention and uh, persisting manner. I look forward to hearing about your council plans prioritizing revitalization to Seamless Park and eagerly awaiting a positive response. Go Southside. Thank you. Jeremy Mays, followed by Charlie Martinez. Good evening again. For the past 15 years, we've faced the reoccurring na narrative of a general fund structural deficit. With each two-year budget cycle, we hear the same story. Proverbially, the sky is falling. It's ironic that these predictions remain consistent despite the shifting political and economic landscapes. It's almost as if the budget is perpetually bipartisan and predictably bleak. Every year, concerns about PERS contributions and unfunded liabilities are raised as scare tactics. We hear about unpredictable property tax and sales tax forecasts. Yet despite these repeated warnings and excuses, when we examine the actual budget, the past, the amended, and the quarterlies, we find a consistent pattern. The city always outperforms, uh, sorry, the city always outperforms and does better than expected. Every single year over the last 15 years, when we've had the structural deficit for the general fund, the revenues have exceeded, exceeded expenditures. You just heard of some of those numbers from Matt. And according to policy, when that happens, it's divided into three accounts the Pension Reserve Fund, the LEAF account, and the Capital Projects Fund. The LEAF account, unaudited from 23, 19.4 million. The Capital Projects Funds, unaudited from 23, 19.4 million. Not to mention the Prudent Reserve sat at 19.8 million, and the Measure U Reserve sat at 17.1 million. All historic highs, despite, and despite this, our reserves are labeled as one-time sources yet these overages occur annually and in the amount of millions. I can share one constant, one fact based on history. For 33 years, Local 2020 has used eight agencies for salary survey. You may recognize the names from that error-ridden MRG report that was used in the last meeting. But the real constant here amid the forecast is that Local 2020 salaries continue to go down when we compare them to the average of our competitors our neighboring agencies, the eight agencies used in our salary survey. And as Matt and I have pointed out, as of July 1st, we'll be 17.5% behind the average of those agencies. While staff comes and goes, the recommendations to transfer in and out to balance a budget remains. But over the last 15 years, there have been numerous capital projects that have been funded entirely in cash, yet we have a structural deficit. It's as if the employees are not the priority, we're just a cog in the system. As you consider this budget, all 391 pages, it's essential to remember our fire department employees. Local 2020 continues to fall further behind in compensation and the men and women who put their lives on the line daily, well, their salaries just don't affect that. Thank you. Charlie Martinez. All right, three minutes, here we go, not enough time. Uh, Charlie Martinez, Vandenberg Professional Firefighters, Local F-116, and uh, uh, you know, uh, 
You heard the numbers, you got the numbers. I mean, you can't deny that. I'm gonna repeat myself. You guys know it. You guys either accept it or you don't. Uh, we have a council that's sitting with his head in the sand. Um, you know, it's a hard job. Fire season's starting right now, as we speak. Fire season's kicking on. And, you know, the, uh, we're not saying firefighters are any different or any better than anybody else, but they do carry a skill set that nobody else has. And that skill set gives them the one pro focus on one priority to save lives. Number one, save lives. The second one is to protect and preserve property. That's a skill set nobody else in this city has. And in other comparable cities, no other worker in the city has a skill set, then it's firefighters. And that's a reality. The set, protecting the lives of the people you are swearing to protect. That's why they elected you. Uh, hours, 56 hours a week. That's without an overtime shift. And as we're going to fire season, they're gonna do that skill set, particular skill set, 17% below their average uh, for 80 hours in a work week. Some of you guys work that, try working that 80 hours work week on your desk jobs. So I, I recommend some of you guys, some of you guys can't do that, but I recommend some of you guys go to the fire, fire, fire uh, training centers. We have ways of putting our electric official. We did it at Vandenberg, we put our commanders through our, our fire grounds. Operative. Give them a little appreciation, a basic little taste of what these professionals do. We're not Rhodes Scholars, uh, some of them are educated, but we're really, in a, in a, when it comes down to it, we're blue collar guys. But the care skill set that nobody else has, and that should be appreciated, not denied. Talk about priorities, you know, anybody's priority, you wanna see a priority, look at their budget. Okay, so you have a budget that says, that actually says, public safety is a priority. Some of you guys ran on this when you got elected. Public safety is priorities. Um, lately, the way we've been looking at it, it's been all show and no go. It's a lot of talk and no walk. And when you're not, when you don't even come, when you don't even communicate with your firefighters, it's a relationship, a relationship with your constituents, relationship with your workers, and when you guys won't even talk to your firefighters, arbitration, you guys went to the table maybe twice, that's not good face bargaining. It, it really isn't. And the information you're being given by the people that are, 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 that are um, advocate, or, uh, advocate on your behalf, okay, they're giving you bad information. And, but they're the ones, you're the ones that they look at. They're the ones that they talk to. You're the ones that answer to them. And you haven't been talking. That's shameful. It really is. It truly is shameful. When you talk about communications, you know, uh, and somebody publicly saying that public safety is a priority, I mean, I really hate to see what, what it looks like when it's not your priority. Because if this is the showing of what is priority to you, to these professionals, some of them are gone now because they're, you heard them get toned out. And it's shameful that you will not sit there and even communicate or advocate and just sit there with blank faces as they're trying to sit there and ask for average share. That's less than 1% of your budget. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. You are totally uninformed. Okay, I will close the public hearing at this point. And Mr. Escobedo, you had questions. Yeah, thank you, Mommy. Yeah, it was. So uh, part of the conversation on the, uh, with this budget, and it's part of the package, there was a uh, idea for the plan of coming back with some uh, budget cuts because I mean I, I was going through all these challenges. I mean we got we talk about compensation, pre premium increases, and liability, and the water, which is always a big challenge, and so on and so forth. Ballot measures and there's a lot of challenges that cities, not just Santa Maria, but throughout the state of California, are facing in regards to the um, the deficit. When have you guys, uh, when would you bring those, uh, that plan, that game plan of start making, you know, adjustments on how we, how we run the city? Councilmember Escovedo, members of the city council, the mayor, thank you. The plan is that in July, assuming you approve the budget tonight, uh, the department directors will get together as a team and look at how to look at trimming back the proposed budget in any places that we can. We would have an opportunity to also discuss some um, revenue generating ideas. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the speaker that spoke about TOT, um, those items, you know, 
any, any increase uh, is going to require a vote of the people. So it's a little bit, those are a little bit further down the road, but we do plan to talk about what options are out there for the city to increase its revenue. As uh, Ms. Bradford mentioned, the goal that we have is to bring you something in the second quarter that would give us a as close to a balanced budget at the end of 24, 25, so that we would min minimally impact the reserve uh, that's being proposed to be spent. Uh, I believe it's 20, 21 million dollars at this point to try to reduce that number, you know, significantly. Uh, ideally, we would like to erase that, but you know, real, realistically, I don't think that that's totally possible. But we're going to make every effort to try and bring it down as much as we can. And I, and I ask this because you know, it was mentioned initiative revenue measures, which is basically tax raising taxes, and that shouldn't be the first the first option. I think that's a uh, you know, our community is struggling so much. So, and, and I've seen other governments in local, state, and federal that when, where there's trouble, let's raise taxes to the people. And at this point, with the economy that we have, I think that we need to look inwards right now and game plan of how we can, sure. before even touching the, the reserve, I, as I mentioned in the, in the in May, in June, I don't like touching the reserve for uh, uh, something, something like this. And uh, the reserve, we don't know where it's going to happen in the next couple of months. Uh, and I don't want to get into a moment where, OK, we don't have any, anything safe for any unforeseen circumstances. So, so OK. If I yeah, can that, address those, that a little bit, excuse me. Yeah, sure, go for it. So, in order for us as the city to have a balanced budget, the reserves are where we're going to have to go. Uh, state law requires that we have a balanced budget and that we have that balanced budget by June 30, July 1st. So that's why you see the proposal ahead of you. Certainly, I think our priority as the people responsible for the expenditures in the city, it will be to try to pull together as much of reductions as we can. Uh, you know, realistically, those reductions, uh, we, we've been down this road before in past city budgets where, you know, we've had to make some hard decisions. Uh, we will bring you back a plan in that second quarter uh, with uh, ideas on where we might want to go and what they mean financially so that you have a good picture. Um, so we, that means that, sorry to throw, so that means that not because of in the budget we're saying that going to pull from the reserve, that doesn't mean that right in July 1st, the reserve are going to be expanded? Correct. Is that, okay. They'll be... Um, it's what, just to make sure that we pass the uh, the requirement from the government uh, as a state, the state correct. government requirement to have a balanced budget. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. But with the commitment that on July, there's going to have, we're going to have a plan of how to reduce that. Second no. quarter. Second quarter. Yes. Okay. Any questions? That's it. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Cordero. Yeah, hi, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, in, in listening to what Council Member Escobedo said about not going to, to the taxpayers and asking for a raise, I, I think that it's already in the plan. That's what we were going to do is to, to present the budget and then bring it come back and, and look at some reductions, which is not really raising uh, the assets, but it's cutting the obligation. And I, and I think we're already doing that kind of a situation there. So I think it's astute to bring up the fact that let's not just automatically raise taxes. And I agree, I have said from this chair that there's never a good day to raise taxes. But, uh, but I, I believe that we're in that process. We're just not moving as fast as some people think we should, perhaps. But we are moving 
to reconcile the the outgo with the income of the funds. Uh, so we're, we're going in that direction. It's just, it's a very slow, and it's a very big wheel, and it moves very slowly. So we're, we're trying, I believe. Ma yes, Ms. Soto? I mean, when it comes to cost reduction, I just want to, I just want to caution, caution folks, um, because when you look at the biggest allocation to the budget, it's, it's, it's salaries, it's benefits. And the last thing I would want us to do is, is, is to jeopardize um, any, any, any positions. And so when I hear us give that directive or ask staff to go back and look at cost-saving measures, I think that we have to be really specific as to what to ensure that, that um, that, that we protect um, and that we ensure job security as best we can to, to our employees. Um, I, I think that the question here would really be like, what are some um, capital projects that, that could possibly be delayed um, to give us some, some, some cushion, some wiggle room? Um, what are some, I mean, what are, what are other, other, what could be other sources of revenue for the city um, to, to be able to close the the gap that that we're seeing in front of us, but the last thing that we should do is really, in 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 my opinion, is is tackle it through a a scarcity um, mindset and really start thinking about how what are some of the ways in which we can generate revenue for the city, so that one we can um, compensate our employees. Um, and ensure that, that, that we put our money where our mouth is. Um, you know, your budget is a moral compass. It, it really shows an organization's um, priorities, and I would like for us to show that our priority lies in our employees. Well, you know, I, we've done that over the years. I mean, we've not ever wanted to, to even lay anybody off and even talk about it. When you look at, say, our enterprise funds, and these are like the wastewater, solid waste, disposal, these are all operations and maintenance, and anytime there's a reserve in there, they stay in the enterprise funds. So it can't be used for anything else, because that's specific. But when you go like, and you can look at our, our, um, our Measure U, for instance, and the uses and what is projected as a revenue, it's just not there. When you look at our LEAF fund, and I mean, a comment was made that we've all, we have these scare tactics. Look at our LEAF fund. We're down to practically nothing. Right, Ms. Bradford? Do we have a chart that shows that? Oh, could we pull up the presentation again? So, Mayor, this is the chart that shows the draw on the reserves, so the LEAF. Okay. We'll draw well, there's eight, the leaf, yeah. 8.3 million. But the one that shows over the years, we've, we, we're have we like at 20,000 and over the years and we've drawn on it, those were not scare tactics. We used those funds so that we kept our employees employed. We did not lay off and that was that's where we used that money. And when we have, uh, it was a comment was made that we <clears throat> have three accounts. This is a policy, not, just this council has adopted, but councils before us adopted, that we would catch up into the, the three accounts, and one of them being the LEAF fund, that we would always keep it healthy, because we did not know when a downturn was going to happen, and we saw that with COVID. Mr. Posada, you had a comment? Thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and to kind of follow up on your comment, one of the reasons that uh, we were able to move forward, uh, we, and I'll use the collective group, but really Public Works is able to move forward on the major road improvements that we saw this past year was that uh, we did allocate money into that capital projects fund uh, in that one third, one third, one third, uh, so that that money would be available. So uh, I know that it has helped raise our, our maintenance, uh, you know, our pavement maintenance uh, index. So uh, those are all uh, important pots of money that need to be there uh, to support the city's efforts in the long run. We, we even closed our library down on, 
on the weekends. And, and um, it's been open for what, about a year now, a year and a half, so that we're open. Yeah. Did you have, Ms. Yes, Sarah? remind me, are, are the capital projects, is that under the general fund? There's like depends 64. On the, depends on the project. Depends on the project, yeah, because they saw about. But we have, we have postponed them. We have postponed buying in the fleet. We've postponed a lot of things when, when we put our employees first and make sure that we're right. not doing layoffs. Right. Um, how, how many, sorry, this is such a large document. Uh, how many of, I think it's 64 capital projects. How many of those are general fund capital projects? Do we have? Stand by. Thank you. We're going to look those up. Um, well, uh, Ms. Bradford looks for that. Uh, just to answer your question, Councilmember Soto, certainly our first approach isn't going to be looking at, at uh, uh, laying off any employees as our first approach. Certainly we're going to look at all our other uh, achievable, uh, the low-hanging fruit, as it were, you know, in, 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 in our organizations. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, that personnel makes the biggest component of our expense. Right. So. Uh, it may not mean laying off, but it may be mean maybe delaying. Uh, that's why we, as as the professional staff, it's our job to bring those plans together and bring them back to you for consideration. Certainly, with that guidance, it certainly will say that you know don't look at layoffs first, uh, right. and it, it certainly was never the plan to do that. It's just that when I hear oh, yes. cut back, and I see that that's the biggest chunk. I understand. I just want to make it clear. I, I think the, uh, Mr. Cordero. I think the, 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 the posture of the city management has been that way for right. a long time through, yeah. through, the, through the pandemic. Uh, there was, uh, you know, cities, some cities were getting ready to close down. Mm -hmm. And we, we never laid a person off. One person did leave, I believe. And I think one or two others were reclassified and went to a lesser paying position, right. but but we we kept all the employees working. And that I didn't feel the need to say that. I felt that that was just a methodology of doing business by the city. So so right. I, I, I hope I didn't imply that we my my recommendation that we look at cutbacks was was uh, was one that that uh, that we needed to cut positions. Although, although when it gets bad enough someday, if it does, cutting positions will become absolutely necessary. And we don't want to do that. Well, I do have a, oh, yeah. Ms. Aguilar Hernandez. On page, on page 238, Capital Projects General Fund. This year, 2023, I see that we used 8 million but the proposed for 2024-2025 is $3 million. Is that correct? That would so be correct. I, I haven't located the entire um, document of precise projects, but yes, if you look at page 142 of the budget, it has uh, a listing of how much money is being allocated towards uh, the capital improvement program projects. And we are proposing out of a total funding for projects of $62 million, there's only $3.5 million proposed in 24-25, funded by general fund sources, and 1.2 from Measure U. And of those $3.2 million, are any of those tied to any specific grants? The 3.2 million is funded from the general fund source. The uh -huh. reason that funding was available was because the sports complex mm -hmm. actually got a grant fund. So we were able to reallocate those funds uh, towards funding some of critical projects. Um, big portion of that is maintenance of the buildings and aging roofs, for example. There's some funding going to that so that the buildings don't continue to deteriorate and are more expensive to replace in the future. Are there any capital projects that are funded through the general fund that could possibly, again, um, be delayed that are not of utmost urgency? And the reason why I bring this up is because we've been 
um, for the last six months, um, hearing from community, community, hearing from firefighters, and I would like to see if there's any way in which we, where we would be able to shift some, some funds um, for, for those salaries. Thank you, Council Member Soto. So uh, certainly that will be one of the things that we evaluate is what projects you know, have to move forward. Mm -hmm. If there are some that, uh, I, I would say all of them are urgent, but if there's some that can be delayed, then we, we, we can consider that. Uh, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that that would come back to you uh, because that would kind of change your, your, uh, your allocations of the three, a third, a third, and a third. So that money would be coming from that, those capital uh, funds that you've set aside. So if you wanted to redirect those capital funds to something else like salaries, then that would be a decision the council would have to make. Thank you. And we, we have the that looming black cloud over us called the wastewater plant that we have to upgrade and that is also state mandated. And we're looking at how many million dollars there? Right well right now it's like what, 200, 300 million? Okay. But by the time we get to it it'll probably be six hundred million. So but wouldn't that, that be paid that, through the enterprise fund? Right, not the general fund. But we still don't have money in the enterprise fund for it. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, if I may, another, yeah, go we're, ahead. since we're still in discussion, um, going back to, to, to the reserves and the LEAF, and I understand that the council has set policies and priorities in, in, in the past, um, but I am of, I mean, I don't know how folks manage their money, but you know, I pay my bills before <laughs> before I put money into a savings account. And so, um, would it be uh, possible for us to really look at um, the amount of of excess revenue, per se, if there were to be any, um, rather than moving that directly into one of our reserves, let's say the leaf fund? given the types of restrictions that we want to put on the LEAF fund through, through the recommended policy um, change that, that, that staff is recommending, if we would be able to first look at where are we with, with salaries, compensation, and use those additional excess dollars to go towards, towards um, closing the gap um, when when one exists like we're seeing now. Council Member Soto, thank you for the question. Members of the City Council, so the policy is yours. Mm -hmm. uh, again, what my suggestion would be is that, you know, the, the staff be able to bring you back the, their ideas and plans. And then maybe at that time, the council can di dive a little deeper into their current existing policies. Mm -hmm. And if there's a, a desire to make a change to those policies, it would be totally up to the council to, to make that, have that discussion and make those decisions. Mm -hmm. And a, a question, a thought that just came to mind as we're on this topic. Um, in lo I, I know that the user fee schedule, that those increases were already included in the budget that we see before us. Um, well, can you explain to me how the salaries are, are accounted for in this budget given that we haven't finalized contract negotiations with Local 2020? Council Member Soto Council, the salary assumptions in the budget for uh, the year 24-25 include assumptions across the board that are exactly the same as the recently negotiated contract with SEIU and also the salary and benefits that you ordered via resolution to non-represented employees. So those are the assumptions included in the budget. So the 5% that was given 5 to SEIU. 5% health insurance. Got it. Any other questions, comments? So from what I understand, this is the first time we're getting the final budget, right? Um, and so we have from now until September to look at the reduction, if there is going to be um, reductions proposed by, by each department and staff 
Is that correct? That would be our plan, yes, is that uh, we would bring you a, a, a list of options and values to those options for council consideration uh, how we plan, how we would plan to reduce that uh, budget deficit. And that would be in that September timeframe for second quarter sometime. Yes, Mr. Cordero. <clears throat> Mr. Posada, those salary reduction, those reductions, is that that would that would be uh, calculating uh, salary savings as well, would it not? I mean, if if, if I've got uh, ten positions allocated and I hold off two positions, then that would be part of the, the savings. That could be yes, definitely. Because there are, there are, there are, there are departments in the city that are holding positions that are not being filled, and I we will use that in the future to cover some of the the cost recovery. Correct. Thank you, Councilmember Cordero. Yes, that would be part of the plan, but it would be the. Even though there are vacant positions, there are some critical tasks that the department would have to decide which positions they, they would want to keep vacant or which positions they, uh, they could delay hiring you know, out. Right, because in this budget, how many new FTEs are we seeing? Is it? How many what? FTEs? Full-time employees. Yes. Four, 14? Right. 14 and so if oh. of those 14 uh -huh. it's important to note that those were approved already by the council in the quarterly reports no nope, these are new sorry my mistake I'll let Zena answer it <laughs> council the proposed budget does include uh, 14 total new FTEs out of those 8.7 are new within the general fund the rest are enterprise funds. Eight are under the general fund. And what are those, can you remind me what those positions are? And how, and what the total compensation would be for those eight positions? Give me just a moment. Sorry. I can get back to you. So Council Member Soto and Council, the details of that were presented with the preliminary budget. And sorry, I'm still looking for that information in detail. are on you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Working as quickly as I can here. I get to it. Going back to our May presentation. Uh, 
Okay, so for general fund new positions, there was um, one confidential technician within the city manager's office at $108,000. Um, another confidential technician and one program leader for $348 million, or $1,000, sorry about that. No, that's a uh, total. total. And then we had Um, there was an addition of a security guard that was budget neutral, actually. Uh, so there was quite a few reclassifications as part of the issue. So it was uh, when we developed the budget, we gave directives to the departments that they needed to bring us budget neutral um, budgets. So they did make some reductions in order to get the positions that they wanted. So as I look through our documentation from the preliminary budget, which uh, very in great detail outlined um, the positions that were reduced and the positions that were added, all adds to the eight positions. Um, if there's anything specific that you're looking for, I would be happy to look for it. What's the total amount? Is it about $800,000? She's mentioned about four hundred. dollars 40, about four and a half, 450,000. So in anything that's related in general fund to positions, there is, let's see. Six, Excuse me, I said 450, it's four, four million, uh, 400,000, Looks almost five hundred thousand dollars. Looks like everything that's related to positions is about eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars for the in, new positions in the general fund. Correct. In the general and with full benefits. And you're saying that those new positions are positions of current employees that were just reclassified? No, these are positions that are being requested as newly funded positions. Um, there were some transitions, and I, as I mentioned in the requests from the departments where they may have said that we have this vacancy that mm -hmm. we are willing to give up in order to get a position that we actually needed in the department. So you will see some of those changes if you go back mm -hmm. to the preliminary budget that was presented to you on the 21st. But a total add is that 8.7 positions in total citywide, and that equates to about 860,000. Any other questions? Okay. Comments? A motion? Mm -hmm. Madam uh, Mayor. Mr. Cordero. I believe we should approve the budget and deal with the aftermath that we are inevitably going to have to deal with. And there's no there's nothing, there's nothing hidden that we're going to have to deal with the shortcomings of this, this budget because it will be short. So Is that a motion? That's a motion. Okay. Do I have a second? Dodge for lack of a second. Well, I'll, I'll second, I'll, I'll second that. Is there a way to add to the motion that we give the directive that we discussed to that we look to the reduction in expenditures, right? So right. I think that needs to be part of the motion is, yeah, we will accept it, but preliminary because this is the first time we're getting a final budget and it needs to be reduced because we have a deficit and we're going to go into our reserves and deplete the reserves, so I... I think you're correct in making that correction. 
Uh, However, I just figured that we're already into that mode and it would be coming. So, so that's let's add it. I don't have any problem. With Mr. Posada, yep. Did you have a comment? I see you nodding. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Certainly, that's the plan. If you'd like yeah. to include it in the motion, I mean, that's fine too, uh, because we will be coming back to you and we will be bringing you a reduction plan, and then it'll be up to the council to adopt that plan. I, have, I need a clarification on the motion. Is this motion just for the budget, or does it also include the policy recommendations proposed? Thank you. Very good question. Yes, it would include the policy if you wish it to, uh, but that is the recommendation from staff is that you adopt it as a whole. Well, I, I think we're required to adopt the budget by June 30th, which is why we have to have a balanced budget. We right. have to adopt. In my opinion, we have to adopt what we have. That doesn't mean we're not going to go back or we can't later change the policies or amend them and, um, you know, amend the budget as well. So I think for today's purposes, we... Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, the reason why I didn't second the motion is because I, I, I feel uncomfortable m moving forward with approving those eight positions that equate to about 860000 um, especially, um, those, those eight positions have we already approved. No, we have not. No, no. We, we haven't. We oh, have thought, not approved. I thought we approved those preliminary. Okay. No. And so okay. uh, <coughs> there's that point. And then the second point uh, and the second reason why I didn't second the motion is because of, of, of needing that clarification of whether this motion included the policy recommendations, because as I stated earlier in, in my comments during discussion, um, I would I I would like for us to first prioritize um, s salaries, um, increasing salaries and benefits as much as we can for employees before um, putting money into our savings account. Especially when we say you know we can't we can't meet you when we have such a large gap. Well, that's fine, except we have policies that do that right now. So if we want to go back and change those policies, that's fine. We need to do that. Um, I think right now it's prudent to pass the budget, come back and make the corrections that we need. Um, and that's my opinion. But what I'm saying... Mr. Escobedo? Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, mm -hmm. I, but, uh, but the policy recommendation that we see for the LEAF fund is stipulating that we want to put in there, what, 25%? D did I misunderstand? Can, can you clarify? Yeah. Percent goal for the LEAF fund. Mm -hmm. Your policy prior to this suggested change just said that you would put one third into leave, one third towards capital, mm -hmm. and one third towards pension. Mm -hmm. So the leave fund, consequently, could grow without a ceiling. And so this policy would actually establish a ceiling for in the leave, leave fund to where once you reach that 5%, you would no longer need to be putting additional funds into that. Oh, OK. OK, thank you for that clarification. Mr. Escobedo. Thank you, Mama. You're it was mentioned that uh, the idea is to bring back the cuts and potential uh, plan. Is it second quarter? We're talking about fall, September? Yes. So here's my, I mean, we've known that uh, that economy was not going well for many, many months before we got to this point. And It just, I wish instead of like right now what I hear is that we're trying to pull like how we're going to save and, you know, talking about cutting positions or uh, putting aside. So right now we're like kind of like brainstorming on something that I think should have been pr discussed months ago when we knew that, when we already knew that this was going to happen. And uh, that just... That's that's the that's a part that really concerns me is, and one of the big items is long-term financial sustainability. That's 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 
I have a big issue because that's people's money, the ones we're administrating. And as I said, the last thing I, I would like to go and knock on people's doors, hey, we, we want to raise your taxes because that's why people don't like politicians and don't want to, and, and, and we're not here to be like, but we're here to be sure of how we manage their money. And uh, I think that it's too far apart September to have that discussion shouldn't be like right away and uh, how we can literally just because we knew that we were going to get to this conversation. So that's just that's what uh, concerns me about this budget. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. Cordero. I, I just would like to check with Councilwoman Soto if you feel a bit more comfortable <coughs> knowing that the third, third, and third is not, we're getting away from that, and they're, they're, the leaf money, for instance, is going to be maximized. We're not going to mm -hmm. put it in to where it grows to 50, 60, 70 million dollars. Mm -hmm. It gets to a point and then that money is going to go into the general fund? Towards the capital improvement program and the pensions. So does that satisfy some of your concern? Yes, um, but again, the other part of the concern was those eight new positions. That, uh, I mean, I agree with Councilman Escobedo, um, but there's something that we can do now um, in respect to, to the budget, and I think that it would it'd be irresponsible of us to approve the budget with those new positions, knowing that we are also given the directive to go back to staff and cut, make cuts. Well, you're assuming that cuts. To the budget, it you're, could be you're, anything. You're, are you assuming that cuts are positions, or are they? I'm just, I'm just stating what the directive thus far has been. Well, I think we've been dealing with the budget and talking about the budget for about two months now. We did have that special session to discuss the budget, and um, we've known for some time, right? We each had a briefing, and we've known for some time that we were in this position. I don't think it's something that we're just learning now. This is the first time, though, that we get the final budget once it was prepared, and making cuts and knowing where those cuts are going to be takes time. It takes a lot of precision, and it takes, it's, it's an art to figure out how do we cut certain projects mm -hmm. and not affect the employees of the city. And so that is why we didn't do it in the last month, um, because we do need to approve the, like I said, the budget by June 30th. So I, for me, I'm ready to, to approve the budget with the caveat that we are going to come back before September or by September to figure out where those cuts will be. I think the council as a whole feels that we shouldn't cut personnel. Mm -hmm. I think that's a directive to, to each department when they relook at the budget and where the cuts will come. Uh, something, yeah, that I asked, something that I asked for today uh, or yesterday, Madam Mayor, is that when, when, um, when these directors come back and say, hey, we can cut here or we can't cut here, that, that they need to identify for us the things that are mission critical. Um, we can't send our police officers out without firearms and we can't send our firemen out without hoses. Those things are mission critical. And, uh, and if they can't articulate that in their memo to us, then they may lose that particular aspect of what they're trying to establish. So I did ask for mission critical information uh, regarding the cuts that are, are going to be asked for. Well, so I, hopefully that yeah. will come about. And the department heads were given the the task of making their budget cost neutral, which means they had to make they had to make cuts already. Um, 
which is fine. Mm -hmm. we, you know, and I agree that that we've had this budget to look at for Five how days. long? Five days. Okay. But we have we we've been talking about it for two months. For we've month. gone through everything. Mm -hmm. Each it's, each yeah. each department director got up at the podium and told us what they were asking for and how it was related to the policies and our priorities as a council. So yes. now we're asking them to go back and look at it even further because we're in a deficit situation. Correct. The bottom line is we're not flush and we don't like it. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Escobedo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And if I, if, if I understand correctly, the idea is to, uh, for uh, directors to bring options. It's not that they can say these ones are the ones and that's that's pretty much what is set up. It's which one and we're gonna see this if we make this cut it will cost like this, it would save us this money, it would tell us uh, and I, I think that uh, Mr. Cordero brought up a really good point of making sure that those the critical needs are taken care of. I think that's a uh, yes we should put our community first, the service that we provide. And uh, definitely last, uh, it was a couple of, two meetings ago, we we're talking about a new uh, fingerprint scan for the police department. I said, well, that's important because without it, we can put in jeopardy a case and that will put somebody out on the streets that shouldn't be. So uh, I really, uh, I definitely support the, uh, the comment of Mr. Cordero and, and uh, yeah, we're gonna see options. So. Uh, I wish could have been uh, this month, actually, <laughs> those options. Yeah, I mean, I think both comments are, are totally valid, and I, I think just something to add to, to that is that just like, you know, we need to ensure that, that the projects, that the equipment, facilities that, uh, that we need to operate are, are vital to the, to the organization, to the city. Yeah. But it's also important to add that that part of that includes um, market wages. You know, we can't send out personnel with below market wages. And so um, that should also be definitely part of the conversation. So that's why I also would like the council to, to take a moment to kind of step back and look at um, approving the budget. Um, without those 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 additional eight positions, Mayor. Yes. So Ms. you do Pisano. have a motion on the floor. So I have a motion. Have to deal I with have that motion. motion and a second. Okay, Madam Clerk, do you want to call the roll? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Cordero. Aye. Mayor Patino. Aye. Uh, Councilmember Aguilera Hernandez. Aye. Councilmember Escobedo. No. And. Councilmember Soto. No. Okay, motion carries 3-2. So, you have the directions, Mr. Posada. Okay. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next report will be uh, interim city manager, Mr. Posada. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, stand by one minute here. lost my paperwork and if any of you didn't have the opportunity to see Miss Bradford work in that computer screen trying yeah. to find the information it's pretty amazing to me Madam Thank Mayor you. members of the City Council so um, for the record uh, there will be no July 2nd uh, council meeting mm -hmm. uh, your next meeting will be on July the 16th at that meeting on the 16th, we, we will have a closed session on labor negotiations and city manager recruitment. Uh, there will be a couple of proclamations, uh, one for uh, National Night Out, which is the police department's um, community event that is held. Uh, we're going to have that proclamation on the 16th of July because the August 6th council meeting will also be canceled. Um, so you'll have a meeting on July 16th and a meeting on July 20th. Um, moving down the items for the 16th of July, uh, we will have a presentation on the, uh, from Recreation and Parks on the, 
City Hall renovation project going on outside. So we kind of bring you up to speed on what's happening out there. Uh, uh, I, I think we're rounding the corner on that project. Uh, so it looks pretty good if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it. Uh, there's also going to be a presentation on the Caltrans grant for uh, Broadway beautification. So you kind of get an update on that. You'll see some of the items are already done. If you've driven the section between Main and Cook Street, you'll see the new uh, crosswalk uh, artwork. You'll see the uh, uh, laser cut panels on the light poles along Town Center East and Town Center West. Those are all funded through Caltrans. Um, we will have a presentation on the uh, Enterprise Resource Planning System, or the ERP. Uh, that will be on a consent item. Sorry, I thought it was presentation, consent. Award of a Professional Services Agreement for Active Transportation Program, also on consent. The 16th, we'll also have the uh, appointments to boards and committees. Uh, we remind the council members to please uh, get with the city clerk find out what vacancies are uh, available, and please um, seek out potential members in the community and uh, have them contact the clerk for, for an application. Um, there will be a, a regular business item on the uh, downtown development agreement, and uh, that should be it for the 16th meeting. We don't see you before Fourth of July. Happy Fourth of July! Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Posada. And I, oh, I'm sorry, and I do want to re remind the council that I will be out of the office starting on the 27th, and Mr. Wu will be covering uh, city manager's office. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have the oral reports of council members. Ms. Soto, should start no with you. No reportable items. Okay. Ms. Aguilera Hernandez. You skip me. You want me, to, you want me to go yeah. down? Okay. Mr. Cordero. Sure. Uh, I attended the Champions Dinner for the Communify, and um, it, it was it was great to see JD Hardy uh, get recognized. I think he does a great job and and um, provides a valuable uh, a valuable service here in Santa Maria. I. Uh, attended the elected leaders uh, forum for addressing the homeless issue. I had to leave that meeting just a little bit early. It was a Zoom meeting. I attended the police uh, badge pinning uh, procedure today. I attended a ribbon cutting out at Nick the Greek's new restaurant at 471 uh, Betteravia, East Betteravia Road. Uh, I have never been to a ribbon cutting where there were so many people and they had a line of probably a couple hundred people that were there ready to go into the restaurant. So it was uh, very well attended. And that's it for me, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Escovedo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On June 6, I had a very interesting uh, eventful uh, right along with the Santa Maria Police Department. Uh, it was supposed to be in, it was planning to be two hours and ended up being four, almost five. It was, uh, it was really interesting to, uh, to go. It was during the evening, night. It, it was a really good experience. I really invite everybody to, to check it out. I've, uh, this is not my first time. I've run it a couple of times before, but uh, it, this one was particularly busy. So, uh, uh, and also on the 8th, I attended uh, the Casa Grande Homeowners Association meeting, and I gave them uh, an update on some items that, as I mentioned during the council meeting, that uh, fireworks, uh, traffic, and homeless were those were the main um, the main topics that we talk about. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Is that you learn it? No. Okay. On the sixth of June, I attended Santa Maria High School graduation. Then I had a League of California Cities Channel Channel counties meeting in the afternoon. In the afternoon, I went to Pioneer Valley High School graduation. At these graduations, over 700 kids at each graduation. Um, on the June 7th, I was here in the chambers where 
Shri Chimnoy Oneness Peace Run came through, and these were people from all over the world. That evening went to Downtown Friday where the soccer team, Surf Elite, was recognized. These are eighth and ninth grade girls. And it goes from Montana down to New Mexico, across to the West Coast, and includes Hawaii. And these girls are the championships, and they come from the Central Coast. And um, they are going to go to Hawaii for the, for the championship of, it's called the Western United States. Um, June 9th attended the California Alliance of Local Electeds meeting. On 11th, again, the League of California Cities Members and Departments Roundtable. I attended Nick the Greek um, ribbon cutting, and it was interesting. I, I have a hard time knowing how many people are at an event, but there was quite a few people all wrapped around the end of the building. On the 12th, I attended the North County Subregional Planning Committee, and um, in the afternoon, the Santa Maria Chamber of Commerce Business Expo out at the Radisson, and that that evening, AT Still had a reception for the founders of AT Still. On June 13th, I attended the Grizzly Youth Academy graduation in San Luis Obispo at the Performing Arts Center there on Cal Poly. And that was, that. if you've never attended one, you need to go to one that was really amazing and very uplifting, not even, um, Tom Bordenaro was the keynote speaker. And I've known Tom for years, but I really never knew his entire story. And if he didn't make those kids think about themselves. And the one thing he said was no whining. He said, I can't stand whiners. Um, I agree. On the 14th, I attended the um, city leadership of Santa Barbara County, along with uh, Mr. Posada. And uh, let's see, on the 16th, the California Alliance of Local Electeds and also attended today the police department um, badge pinning. And I'm trying to think, there were six, five young, young men. And there were over 21, I did check. Did you? Oh my goodness, okay. And that is it. Anything further? No. In this I meeting? We should acknowledge that uh, past council member Michael Motes, Dr. Motes, is here tonight. It's a good evening. Time I've seen good him evening, here Dr. A Motes. Weeks, a couple yeah. of meetings. Yeah for the budget meeting too. Yeah. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Thank mm -hmm. you.